going to switch off the for the uh, appellant. Uh, my learned friends, Mr. Weir and Mr. Evans represent the um, respondent who is claimant alone. Yes, now just before you um, start, Mr. Wilker, first of all, may I thank everybody for um, coming to court today. I uh, hope it was made clear that it was not in any way a diktat, but an invitation to come and do this uh, case before us. But uh, I'm sure everyone will find it uh, a much more beneficial hearing as a result, so we're very grateful to yes, all sir. of you. Um, we've read, um, had an opportunity of reading all the papers, for which thank you and your skeleton arguments. Um, I, I think we were, were slightly surprised that it's got a time estimate of more than a day. Uh, are you anticipating the case lasting into a second day? Um, lady, I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't have thought so. No. I think we allowed a little extra, so one never knows. Yeah, how many questions? Uh, well, with asked? remote hearings, and I so think on. the reason I really raise it was because if it's a remote hearing, then with breaks, and, and sometimes it can take a lot longer. Yes. Milady, if, if, for the assistance of the court, I would hope and expect to complete my submissions uh, before the uh, short adjournment. Yes. And uh, I, I don't know what my lady does. that sound sensible to you? My, my lady, I leave it to my lady friend to make his own submissions, but I don't expect to finish by four. You don't? No, my lady. All right. Okay. Well, it's listed to tomorrow. It's just uh, for the purposes of listing and um, yes. and our staff. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Mr. Walker. The court will have, I trust, um, two bundles: the core bundle and the supplemental bundle, and also two bundles of authorities. Yes. Um, I propose adding to the authorities bundles uh, a single authority, a case called Derby and the National Trust. Uh, which I will, which I will hand up three copies. May I just check because some uh, some courts and some judges we don't take anything from the from the court. It has to be emailed through and our clerks printed. But let me check with my colleagues whether they're content. Are you content to have anything? Yes, we'll we'll take them. Thank you. I'm very I'm much obliged. And uh, so there's a single additional authority, Derby. It's called Derby the National Trust. Your ladyship will have seen it referred to in some of the other mm. cases. And also, I have um, copied an additional section of Clark and Linsell. My learned friend has uh, copied uh, and is relying upon some parts of Clark and Linsell, and I've uh, photocopied some additional pages for the court. So, if I may, uh, can I hand up three copies of um, that authority and the relevant pages of Clark and Linsell? Let me just see. Let, I'm continue. not coming to them immediately, but I'll indicate yes. well, where they just must go. In due course. So, um, yeah. that side. Yes, just, just put them there and I'll sort them out. Thank you. Yes. Your ladyship's having uh, indicated that you've um, written with the papers will be obviously familiar with the circumstances of this uh, tragic uh, accident, tragic fatal accident. Um, may I start by um, just inviting the court to look at two or three of the photographs? Certainly. Um, there's no issue arising out of these. But they, 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 they um, give an indication of, um, of the circumstances which apparently which may be clearer than, uh, than the pure narrative. Uh, page 28 of the uh, supplementary bundle. Um, 
Now, we're going to, I suspect, throughout the day and into tomorrow, have difficulties with page numbers, because certainly on my bundles, a lot of them, the page numbers are obscured. I'm sorry, uh, to, that is so, Emily. In this supplementary bundle, certainly in the copy I have, the page numbers are in the top right-hand corner. Yes. It's page 235 at the bottom. Yes, that, that, yes. that pagination was from the trial bundle. Yes. But the pagination for the purposes of this appeal is on the top right hand. Yes, side. yes, but the difficulty is Some that it's alluded to, it's cut off on ours. The top is. Yes. Right hand. Yes. I, I do apologise for that. Uh, right, so we've got the front of the white lion on what on the old pagination 235. On the, on the, on the, on the trial bundle, pagination 235, it's page 38 yep. of, of the appeal bundle. And you see the front of the White Lion Hotel, and to the right of the entrance, uh, on the second floor, uh, the window from which the deceased fell. And you can see it, it has the reflection of a camera mm -hmm. uh, on it. Uh, and you can see it's uh, slightly open at the top. That is the um, condition in which the window was found to be following the, um, the accident. And then at um, page uh, 30 or 253 of the trial bundle, there's a general picture of the uh, interior of room 203 uh, facing towards the window. Um, and the bed that one can see adjacent to the window uh, is right up against the wall. So there's no room to walk between that bed and the wall. Uh, in, in which the window is uh, located. Mm -hmm. um, there's another view of that uh, on page uh, 31, which is page 254 of the trial And then finally, on um, what was page 289 of the trial bundle, Sorry, two eight. I haven't eight, got a two eight nine. Lady, it's um. I don't have a two eight nine. No, no the last the last page you got two eight five. Yeah. Two eight five. That's the one. Yes, two eight five. Two eight five is another. Is a similar shot. Yes, we have it. Thank you very much. Yes, two 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 eight five. Um, that that is a picture which was taken on a subsequent occasion because you really can see there are no clothes on the floor. Yes. And um. The window has been so they've managed to keep to, to to open the window and keep it open for the purpose of the photograph. But as your ladyship knows, the the window was um, self closing, um, and so that gives an indication of the uh, aperture through which the deceased fell mm -hmm. and the uh, hazard that it presented, insofar as it did present a danger to people using the room. Um, the defendant's case, my case, is that the uh, claim was uh, could not succeed because of the principle of law that an occupier has no duty to safeguard the visitor against known uh, dangers. That's a proposition which uh, is supported by a number of cases, some of which I'll show the court in due course. But um, it's succinctly expressed in the judgment of Lord Justice McComb in Edwards and Sutton, which you'll find at um, page five of my skeleton.
Edwards and Sutton is, in my submission, an important case. It was, it was of course, binding on the learned judge, and it is uh, indistinguishable, in my submission, from the um, circumstances of the present case. I mean, obviously, it was a footbridge and not a window, but uh, the principles are indistinguishable. The claimant had succeeded at first instance. Um, this court allowed the defendant's appeal. And um, at the foot of paragraph, page 5 of my skeleton, paragraph 14, I set out what Lord Justice McCoon, with whom the other members of the court agreed, said. He said, the reason for this answer lies, I think, in two well-recognized principles of law. First, there is the proper treatment in law of the concept of risk. Uh, and then the second, the occupiers of land are not under a duty to protect or even to warn against obvious dangers. Both these propositions appear in the speeches in Tomlinson's case. The second proposition is, in my judgment, a particularly forceful consideration in this case, that there was a, some risk of a fall and the potential for injury must have been obvious. The approach to the bridge was clear and unobstructed. The width of the bridge and the height of the parapet were also obvious to the eye. The bridge was also over water with whatever might be beneath its surface. Any user of the bridge would appreciate the need to take care and any user limiting the width of the bridge's track by pushing a bicycle to his side would see the need to take extra care. Now that is a succinct statement of the principle. The best known authority for it is of course the decision of the House of Lords in Tomlinson, but there are authorities both before Tomlinson and after Tomlinson um, uh, stating this principle. Um, it, it's uh, significant in my submission that uh, there are among the authorities um, about a dozen referred to either in the judgment or in Clark and Linsell in which the claimant's claim has failed on this ground and we'll need to look at some of them. There are no cases I would submit in which the claimant has succeeded, notwithstanding this principle. And um, in Geary and Weatherspoons, mm -hmm. Mr. Justice Coulson, as he then was, challenged the claimant's counsel to draw to his attention any case in which a claimant had succeeded in circumstances where he had taken an obvious risk of which he was aware, and no cases were cited to and also in this case, I pointed out to the learned judge that among the uh, myriad authorities which were being cited, not one was a case in which the claimant had succeeded in the face of this principle. The learned judge found as a fact that the deceased was aware of the risk and chose to accept it. And that finding at paragraph 76 of the judgment is set out in paragraph 1 of my skeleton argument. In my judgment, the deceased will have recognized that if you sit on a windowsill, part out of the window, that there's a risk that you may lean too far out or lose your balance slightly to the fall. The deceased chose to sit on the windowsill and accept that risk. There was no hidden feature or element. Brackets, he knew that the sash window had to be held up. That, that, is, that is an unequivocal finding of fact. And that should have been, in my submission, the end of the claimant's case. But the learned judge reached the opposite conclusion via a forensic route which he devised for himself. which uh, may be summarized as follows. 
that this principle is displaced where the defendant has been convicted of a criminal offence. Because it's the policy of the law, or it must be the intention of must have been the intention of Parliament when enacting Section 25 of the Occupiers Liability Act. But notwithstanding that provision, where there was criminal responsibility, it would necessarily follow that there would be civil liability. That uh, is a proposition for which there is authority and which in my submission is incorrect and is inconsistent with all of the leading authorities in this field. This appeal does not seek to challenge any of the judge's findings of fact. My learned friend, I think, as I read his um, skeleton, seeks to go behind one of the findings of fact. <coughs> in that he asserts that the judge ought to have found that the defect in the window, whereby it wouldn't stay open, was in some way um, a hidden hazard. Which created a risk which the deceased had not accepted. That is, in my submission, um, an impossible contention by reason of the express finding of the judge in paragraph 76, in brackets, there was no hidden feature or element. He knew that the sash window had to be held up. Also, quite apart from that finding, there is simply no logic in the submission. The fact that the window uh, wouldn't stay open was obviously a, a, a defect in that the window wasn't doing what a window properly should do. But in fact, far from creating a hazard, it was an unwanted safety feature. Because consider uh, what risks there were presented to visitors to the room by the open window with its low threshold. There, there, one can conceive of ways in which a visitor, in particular a child, could sustain injury. Uh, the child might um, be bouncing on the bed um, uh, with the window open and fall out of the window. The child might be running past the window and trip. Uh, an adult, I suppose conceivably, might be doing something on the bed and then overbalance out of the window or might be walking past the end of the bed and trip over his shoelaces or something like that, or faint while kneeling down and fall out of this aperture. All of those are, at any rate, theoretical possibilities. But none of those possibilities exist in the case of this particular window because it wouldn't be open. It's only open, and it was only open on this occasion, because the deceased chose to open it. He chose to open it and to hold it open and thereby to create the risk which manifested itself in, uh, in this act. In my submission, there is in this uh, case really a single issue which may be expressed as issue of law, which may be expressed as follows. 
we're a claimant of full age and capacity. Suffers injury. Caused by an obvious danger. The risk of which he has knowingly accepted. May the defendant nevertheless be held liable to him by reason of his having been convicted of a criminal offence. arising out of the creation of the danger. could be framed more narrowly by reference to occupier's liability by referring to the claimant as a visitor and the uh, defendant as an occupier and uh, the risk as a risk uh, due to the state of the premises. But the principle isn't confined to occupier's liability. It applies uh, throughout the law. It, it's encountered most frequently in relation to occupier's liability. Because in the nature of um, things, the, the, the scenario will be a dangerous state of affairs, which presents a risk which the claimant then chooses to run. And the dangerous state of affairs will usually be the state of premises. It doesn't have to be. And in the context of this case and these facts, which we cannot forget, this was a claim brought under the occupier's liability. Yes. So let us not lose sight of the facts of this case and the premise, the legal premise on which the claim was brought. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. It was and could only be brought under the occupier's yes, liability. Yes, I agree. Now, The argument, well, I, I, I described it below as the insuperable point, um, the, no, the known danger point, the insuperable point. Um, the insuperable point uh, may be expressed, and my own friend expresses it, as uh, valentine non fit in uri, the Latin maxim valentine non fit. That, that um, Latin phrase is not used very much these days in the modern cases. Um, but, um, and, and it's a doctrine which encompasses uh, another scenario completely, and that is the scenario where the claimant accepts the risk in advance of the defendant's breach of duty. The, 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 the um, proposition which I have contended, uh, of course, is confined to cases where the risk already exists before the claimant's conduct in accepting the risk. There is a static risk, as it were. The other aspect of Valentai uh, comprises cases in which the claimant uh, is said to, and in some cases is found to, have accepted the risk of future negligence. 
The most obvious case of that is accepting a lift in a car from a, a very drunken driver. And in relation to that category of case, um, it, it's much more difficult to invoke the doctrine because you have to show in effect that the claimant uh, agreed in advance to run whatever risk uh, might eventuate. And there are, there are, the Lone Friend quotes one case in which, about 50 years old, in which um, uh, the, the court said there has to be virtually an agreement between the claimant and the defendant before the doctrine will operate. But that is applicable to that category of case and not to the category, this category of case, the static risk which exists in advance of um, the claimant's acceptance of it. So are you given, as I come back to, that this was a claim brought under the Occupier's Liability yes, Act? Yes, Is your position in respect of Section 2, subsection 5, that that encapsulates the concept of a valentine? Yes. 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 The, the problem... The proposition for which I, the insuperable point, uh, it really has statutory uh, formulation in section 2.5 of the Occupier's Liability Act. So the various types of Valenti that you've described, you would say apply equally to section 2.5? Well, so, no, section 2.5 is only, is only concerned with the, with the, the, the category of Valenti where the risk of exist course, in advance, uh, by in advance of the claimant's yes. acceptance of it. Yes. The other category of the lentai Well, then nothing to do with would, would not be called no. by Section 2.5. But you're not saying that the test in the 2.5 type is other than that which is seen in the authorities? Of that no, 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 not at all. You, you could, I suppose, have a, a cases of the opposite kind in, a, in, a, in an, an occupier's liability uh, situation. For example, maybe the, the visitor was going to occupy a room and the uh, occupier warned him that there were going to be some uh, building works taking place while he was occupying the room and that uh, they would present some hazard to him because there'd be builders and building materials around. In other words, some, some possible future risk. Anticipated And uh, the, the visitor said, oh, well, that's all right with me. I'll just work around it or something of that kind. And then uh, there was uh, an accident due to, I don't know, a, a contractor dropping a scaffold pole on the visitor or something of that kind. And uh, if the defendant said that the claimant was valentia to that, uh, he'd have a hard job because he'd have to show that the claimant had willingly accepted the, that, that risk. So it could exist in an occupier's liability, but, it, but, but it, it, it's unlikely to. So, now, Mr. Walker, yes, accepting yes. as you do that the risk already exists and it's what you describe as a static risk, yes. in the context of this case and these facts, mm -hmm. what are you accepting was the risk which this window created? It created... Um, a small risk of visitors falling from the window other than by uh, a risk which was obvious to them and which they chose to run. And I gave some examples, oh, I saw, tried to give some examples earlier. The, the, the most obvious I can think of is a child. The, the window being open and the child falling out of the window while bouncing on the bed, something of that kind, or the, the visitor looking out of the window and, and fainting or something like that. <coughs> tripping over his shoelace or some obstruction on the floor. Um, your, your ladyship will, of course, bear in mind that the prosecution was not based solely on this window. No, let's leave the prosecution on one side. Yes, ma'am. Let's deal with what you are accepting is the static risk in this case. Yes, ma'am. It arises from the window. Yes. 
What I'm seeking to identify are the factors which create that risk. Is it one, the height of the window? Is it two, the lack of a restriction on the window, which was later inserted? Or three, the fact that there was no proper mechanism uh, to keep it open at the time? No, it's certainly not three. It's the, it's the height of the window coupled with the very low threshold at the, at the base of the aperture. It's, it, it's only 18 inches from the ground. That's, the, um, that's what's unusual about this window. What about the lack of restrictions which were placed within 24 hours after the inspection had been carried out? Well, the, 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 the restrictions are only required uh, by reason of the danger which exists. And your ladyship was asking me, I, I think, what, what is the danger that I was accepting existing? And that, that danger is the danger of falling out of a window which um, has a very low uh, threshold and which is open, opens to a sufficient height to enable someone to fall through the aperture. That's the hazard. Uh, the fitting of restrictors is a way of meeting that hazard. As I point out in my skeleton, it's, although that was what was in fact done, that wouldn't be the only way in which the occupier could have met that hazard. The occupier could have uh, placed a barrier across the window, a bar across the window, could have, um, um, in theory at any rate, altered the window so as to raise the height of the, to, it's a listed to a more building, normal height. It? He wouldn't in fact be allowed to do so because it's <laughs> so a listed I'd, building. So I but think if, well, if we can stick to the facts of this yes, case, I think. the facts it's... of this case, he couldn't have done that. Um, he could have fitted. Um, window restrictors which were removable. Uh, these days I dare say most of us have windows which have window restrictors which we screw into place when we're leaving the premises so burglars can't get in. But when we're on the premises uh, we, re we remove the restrictors to enable us to open the windows. That could have been done. So you could have removable restrictors. Um, the way in which it was in fact uh, met was by simply knocking into the window frame some, restri some, uh, some restrictors which were in. But um, the, the, the offence, the criminal offence, was not failing to have window restrictors. The criminal offence was failing to ensure the safety of visitors, of persons who are not employees. How the Occupier chose to ensure that would be a matter for him. Now, the learned judge recognised, at any rate, following the application for permission to appeal, that this was a groundbreaking decision which was, broadly speaking, unsupported by authority. And I'd ask the court to look at his observations when granting permission to appeal. They're in the core bundle at page 87. Actus Interveniens, which um, would, would not be applicable on my case anyway. Um, grounds 1 to 7, he says, having considered Mr. Walker's written submissions, including grounds, and although they wouldn't cause me to alter any aspect of my judgment, I accept that an appeal on the basis of grounds 1 to 7 has a real prospect of success. There's no authority on the intera interaction between the general obligation under Section 3 of the Health and Safety and Work Act and the Occupiers Liability Act, other than Hamster Teeth Swimming Club and Corporation of London. A 
and as a result the principles of laws to be applied are far from settled. Hampstead Heath mm. Swimming Club, which we'll look at in due course, was an authority which the judge had found for himself. It wasn't cited by uh, either party to him. Um, uh, and he says here, I would observe that arguments are now raised which are not raised before me, e.g. in respect of grounds three and four, as I set out, set out in paragraph 78 of the judgment, neither counsel made any reference to section 2.5 of the 1957 Act. Uh, I, I, I accept that I didn't expressly refer to section 2.5, I referred to um, to the principle, um, uh, which uh, in fact is the same principle as, as is uh, the subject of section 2.5, the very dangerous principle. Um, however, even if I were of the view that any of the grounds did not have a real prospect, I would accept that there's some other compelling reason for all the grounds to be heard, in that all aspects of my reasoning should be considered by the Court of Appeal. Grounds 1 to 6 have an obvious degree of overlap. Given the lack of appellate authority on the central issue and its importance generally. Now, the central issue is the question which I suggested is the issue and the only issue of law in this appeal. Namely, is the, is the ordinary law displaced by the fact of the criminal conviction? Now, the, the question which I suggested uh, is the, the only question of law which arises as described as a central issue. Namely, whether notwithstanding the Section 2.5 principle, the fact of conviction enables the claimant to, to establish liability. Um, it was a question to which the judge obviously gave the answer yes, and to which the correct answer is no. Uh, in my submission. And it's important to recognize in my submission what the central fallacy in the judge's reasoning is. And it's this. The effect of Section 2.5 of the Occupier's Liability Act and the insuperable point, or brackets the insuperable point. Why don't we just deal with 2.5? Because <clears throat> I'm just concerned we're losing sight of the very statute which provided the basis for this yes. claim. So when the statute is there and the relevant provision is there, would it not be sensible, Mr Walker, to deal with the provision? Yes, certainly. Thank you. I was about to... Uh, I, was in, I was in course of uh, articulating what in my submission is the essential fallacy in the judge's reasoning, and it's this. The effect of section 2.5 is that the defendant owes the claimant no duty of care at all in respect of that risk. That's also, of course, the effect of the, the, the effect of um, the insuperable point. But uh, I, I simply add now section two five uh, is set out uh, or 
which is copied on page 3 of the core bundle of authorities, divider 1. And happily we don't have dividers, so we'll have to rely on page numbers. Um, and the page numbers page do numbers. work in the authorities bundle. I hope the page numbers are legible. Yep, yep. No, they are in the authorities bundle. They're absolutely yeah. fine. That's really, a bit sad not to have dividers, really but we're fine with the page numbers. But, so, page three of the core bundle of authorities. Yes. The common duty of care does not impose on an occupier any obligation to a visitor in respect of risks willingly accepted as his by the visitor. The question whether a risk was so accepted is to be decided on the same principles as in other cases in which one person owes a duty of care to another. So the effect of this is that the defendant owes the claimant no duty of care. It's not that he's not in breach of it or that the action is in some way precluded, notwithstanding a breach, there is no duty. And if there is no duty to the claimant, the defendant's conviction of a criminal offence cannot create liability. Because the criminal statute does not create a civil duty. So in respect of this risk, identified in paragraph 76 of the judgment. The White Lion Hotel owed Mr. James no duty. And the criminal conviction can't change that. consider a situation in which the visitor <coughs> to this room chooses to jump out of the window. I think even a learned friend would concede that he couldn't maintain or his widow couldn't maintain an action against the defendants in respect to his death caused by choosing to jump out of the window. But the question arises, or well, the question my friend then would need to answer is why can't she? And the reason is that there's no duty to him. Just as there's no duty in the circumstance of the present case. It's not a case of novus actus intervening. That wouldn't be a case of novus actus intervening. Which my friend might, might say is the answer. It's not the answer. And the reason is that the doctrine of novus actus intervening postulates an actus intervening between the breach of duty and the damage. So in Novus Actus Interveniens cases, there's a breach of duty, there's some damage, but the defendant says that damage shouldn't be attributed to the breach of duty because of uh, Novus Actus, which might be the conduct of the claimant himself, or it might be the conduct of some third party. But the doctrine depends upon, ha has as its starting point, the existence and breach of a duty. 
where, the, where, the, where a person jumps out of the window, he doesn't, his, his action doesn't fail because it's an oversight of his independence. It fails because there was no duty to him in respect of that risk. In the context of this case and these facts and the risk which you've accepted, was that yes. a foreseeable risk? Of doing what he did? It, as you put it, there was a small risk of visitors falling from the window other than by a risk obvious to them. Was that a foreseeable risk? What, the small risk? Yes. Oh, yes. It would have to be a foreseeable risk. I agree, but I just wanted to clarify no, no, that yes. with you. Sorry can, I, sorry, can I be clear about what you're accepting, Mr Walker? Um, you're accepting that the, that the small risk that you described, somebody tripping over and falling out of it, yes. that's a foreseeable risk? It has to be a foreseeable yes. risk. Okay. Otherwise, the, otherwise the, the criminal offence wouldn't be committed. Sure, but you're not, you're not accepting that what happened to the, the deceased is a foreseeable risk. Is that right? It doesn't matter whether it's foreseeable or not. Um, I'm, not, I'm not accepting that it was, but it doesn't. No, okay. it, it, there, it, in many of the cases, I mean, it, take, take Geary and Weatherspoon sliding down the banisters. This was a foreseeable risk, it was a known risk. Many people had slid down the banisters. Some of them had been quite seriously injured. Um, and, and, and the unfortunate claimant uh, was rendered, I think, tetraplegic as a result of this particular incident. But it, this was a known risk. Yes, but it was also a known risk where staff at the establishment had sought to dissuade people not to do it. They made the decision not to put up a notice because they thought that actually would attract people yes. to sliding down the banisters. Yes. But they attempted to dissuade them if they thought there might be a chance. Yes. In this case, nothing whatsoever was done. No, the lady, I, I, I agree with respect. But that conflates breach of duty with the existence of a duty. The question whether the defendants did enough or did anything or should have done more or should have done anything all go to the question of whether the defendant is in breach of duty. The threshold question is whether there's a duty at all. Yes, but that, that you get to on your submissions by applying 2-5. For myself, I don't jump quite so easily to 2-5. I look at 2-2 first because one's looking. I mean, there's no issue, but that the defendants owed the common duty of care to the visitor, of the course. claimant. That is it. And that is why I'm seeking to identify what you are accepting in terms of the identified risk and the foreseeability of that risk. Yes. Milady, um, it is accepted, of course, that the White Lion Hotel owed Mr. James some duty. The duties were to safeguard him against some risks. Foreseeable risks. Some foreseeable risks. That would include a duty to safeguard him against um, tripping over his shoelaces and falling out of the open window. <coughs> or more generally, suffering injury as a result of one of the risks against which it was the duty of the defendant to safeguard him. That's the starting point, section 2.2. Two. Yes, it is. I agree. Then one gets to 2.5. hypothetically begins with the word however, because it's a derogation from section 2.2. The duty does not impose an occupier any obligation in respect of a particular class of risk, that is to say risks willingly, willingly accepted. It's a derogation from section 2.4. Now, the court will be familiar with the um, principle in uh, when one's considering the, the scope of duty of care. The principle of scope of duty. It's the, the, the words of um, 
is it Lord, Lord Bridge in, um, in Caparo and Dickman? It's never sufficient to ask whether there is a, whether the defendant owes a duty to the claimant. The question is whether the defendant owes a duty in respect of the particular risk which has um, caused damage, manifested itself in damage to the to the claimant. So this this underlines Caparo and Dickman, uh, Samco. The, the court would be entirely familiar with the, the principle as it operates in those cases. Duty in respect of valuation of a security uh, does not extend to it. it, it uh, it's to safeguard the claimant from risks due to the uh, inadequate valuation of the security, but not other risks uh, fall in the property market and so on. So scope of duty is um, central to the question of whether a claimant can succeed in negligence against a defendant. Now, I've, I've already accepted what your ladyship question, that the defendant owed some duties in respect of some risk, but not this risk, that's the whole point. Well, when you say this risk, what exactly are you referring to? I'm referring to the risk willingly accepted. No, no, forgive me, um, thought is wholly mine, Mr Walker, I haven't phrased the question correctly. In the, again, let's deal with the facts of this case. Yes. What do you identify as the risk which this claimant willingly accepted? He willingly accepted the risk that if he chose to sit on a window cell and part out of the window with the window open, obviously, mm -hmm. he might lose his balance and fall. just go, and my apologies for taking you um, off, but I'm just concerned we're losing sight of the facts in this case. Can we just go to the judgment? Yes, ma'am. Where we have the specific findings of fact of the judge. Uh, I think it's 38, is it? Um. Where he begins set out his factual findings. And I think it... it uh, really 31, the ladies, uh, under the heading findings of fact. Yes, but the reality is he... There's, there's a preamble, I don't mean that in any pejorative way. But then, really, um, from 38 on, and in particular, um, 39 and 40 and 41. Yes. He finds he was probably sitting on the sill. Yes. Um, he would be able to open the lower sash window and then keep it open. Yes. Uh, I find he sat on the sill and kept the bottom sash window open. It would have been slightly but not very awkward position. He probably leant out but with his weight distributed such that he did not fall out. However, tragically, his balance altered and he couldn't prevent himself from falling. And, and you yes. very helpfully told the court, and it was in your skeleton argument, there's no challenge to the findings of fact. Absolutely. So that's where we are on the factual scenario. Yes, ma'am. So on that scenario, the risk is that he's sitting on the sill and keeping the bottom sash window open. Yes. In what the judge describes as a slightly awkward position. Yes. Probably lent out, but with weight distributed. Yes. And you're accepting on the on those findings of yes. And based on that finding, if we may turn over to paragraph seventy six, which is the central paragraph which I read to the court already. <coughs> the judge accepts that this was an obvious risk. The 
deceased would have recognized if you sit on a window sill part out of the window, there's a risk you may lean at too far out, lose your balance slightly, and fall. The deceased chose to sit on the window sill and accept that risk. Now that's uh, obviously a value judgment, but it's a judgment which he's entitled to make and indeed required to make for the purpose of considering the defence. Mr. Walker, you referred a couple of times to tripping over shoelaces as a part of the. I know you were just yes. giving it by way of example of a small risk, but somewhere in the judgment, and for some reason I just can't put my hand to it, the judge talks about the fact that people would want to open the window and go to the window, mm -hmm. and also that the realities of life for hotel owners was that people would try and smoke out the window. Page 69, Melinda. Paragraph 63B. That's the, that was the in bracket, which is the very purpose of the sash window and only to open. Yes, it's, it's, it's just I thought that for completeness sake, when we're looking at this aspect yes. raised by my lady, that, that that's part of the the, the findings and, and the, the, the total yes, picture that lead up to the what you call want, the want central the, finding. This yes, and indeed that that was a submission that, that I met that I made. Uh, it was put to me there was no social utility in not having window restrictions. And I said, well, there was actually, because when there are windows, people, especially in warm weather, people want to open them. And um, Mr. James and his, and his companion would no doubt have been very miffed if they'd found that they couldn't open the window. Um, people, uh, yes, it's, it's foreseeable that people will want to open the window. Um, as I've submitted, for, foreseeability is not the test. It doesn't matter whether this is foreseeable or not. The question is not whether it was foreseeable that he would um, accept the risk. The question is whether he did accept the risk. Um, I don't accept, if, if it were material, that it's foreseeable that someone will sit on the window ledge halfway out, precariously balanced, such that if he overbalances, he will fall. No, I understand that. Meters. So um, I, I don't accept that it's foreseeable that, that any more than that it's foreseeable that someone's going to jump out of the window. I mean, in a sense, anything's foreseeable. Any more than someone would jump out of the window? Do you well, really mean that? No, I don't really mean no, that. I mean. <laughs> no, it's, it's putting it too high. But. Um, It, it, the question doesn't depend on foreseeability, as I've submitted, but I don't accept, if, 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 if your ladyship's considered it uh, relevant, that it's foreseeable that someone will sit, would have to be astride the window ledge, actually, because if he was just sitting on the window ledge, he'd have his back to the window. So he's got to be astride the window ledge, <coughs> part way out of the window. But even if the occupier did foresee that, he'd be entitled to say, well, if that's what uh, someone chooses to, to be foolish enough to do, then that's really his own lookout. That's what he... Um... It's not for me to stop him. So, Mr. Walker, I was trying to, I was trying to imagine w what the deceased was doing when he fell. Um, given, given the small size of the opening. So, so the way that you picture it is that he was sitting astride the window. Because the judge, the judge just says he was sitting part way out of the window, but he doesn't yes. explain to what extent he was outside the window, and that's what I'm struggling to but understand. He, 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 he couldn't be sitting with his back. Mm -hmm. I suppose he could in theory, but highly improbable that he'd be sitting with his back to the window. He'd yeah. be sitting sideways on, one would anticipate. Right. So um, his right leg would presumably be outside the window or on, on the window edge, as it were. And he'd be holding the window up. So, so, so does that mean that his torso and his head were outside the window? Probably, yes. 
So they, they, they certainly have to be at some stage, or he couldn't afford them. Well, I, I'm just trying to imagine, because he's five foot seven inches tall, and the opening is only, what, about two feet tall? About three feet, I think, but... Um, just how much is three feet? Um, you know, I can get this from the beginning of the charge. Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of um, measurements at the beginning yeah, of the charge, aren't there? Yeah, it's in paragraph five of the judgment. Yeah. The top of the open window is three feet seven inches above the floor. Yeah, but then you've got to subtract from that the eighteen inches. Yes, absolutely. Of the um, space yes, between the. Yes, that's quite. The relationship's quite right. Yes. It, it does c concern me this type of speculation, if I'm if I'm being honest, because the answer is nobody knows. I'm sorry, uh, the answer is nobody knows because, you know, another way just looking at the photograph would be he could have been sitting effectively with his back against the upright, with his legs on the inside of the window and his shoulder propping up the, um, yes. you know, I'd, I don't know. And it, but I'm, I'm just concerned if we try and enter into too much speculation about how well, he was no, sitting look, look, beyond look. that which the judge found, which I know isn't a complete answer, but... Well, with, with respect, it's, th this court uh, should not uh, interfere with the judge's inferences. We, no one can know exactly what he was doing, um, and the judge had to do his well, best. I'm, I'm just to trying to understand um, what, what the implications are of the judge's findings. I'm not, I'm not trying to speculate trying to understand, given the size of the orifice, what it is that the judge is finding. The judge, isn't, the judge doesn't articulate exactly where he finds the uh, deceased torso to be while he's sitting no. on the window ledge. Um, whether he's uh, crouched down, uh, whether he has the window fact, resting on his shoulder. I think says somewhere that he wasn't crouched inside the room. No, that's in, that, that was my suggestion. He's more likely, to, uh, my suggestion was, right. he's likely to have been to the right of the window, to the end, at the end of the bed, right. leaning out of the window. Mm -hmm. The judge thought it, that would be an awkward position and the judge thought it was more likely he was sitting on the sill. But right. uh, it, it, it doesn't actually matter because mm -hmm. what one does know is that he must have been in a precarious position, because otherwise he couldn't have fallen. Well, I, I share the concern um, of my lady, Lady Justice King, that we can't speculate. Mm. I, I'm not sure we can speculate as to whether the position was precarious or not. Well, my lady, with respect, it, it must have been precarious, otherwise he couldn't have fallen. But more particularly, um, the finding at paragraph 76 really imports that. If you sit on a window sill part out of the window, there's a risk you may lean too far out or lose your balance slightly and fall. That is, by definition, a precarious position. All right, Mr. Walker, if, if, so that I understand the way you're putting precarious in that context yes. very well. Yes. Lady, uh, before the, 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 the recent discussion, um, I was uh, addressing your uh, ladyships on the proposition that when considering whether a defendant is in breach of a duty of care or owes a duty of care, uh, one needs to consider the scope of that duty. This is Byron Dickman, Sam Care. Uh, the fact that the occupier, the, the defendant, owed the deceased some duties, duty to safeguard him against some risks, doesn't mean 
that it owed him a duty to safeguard him against this risk. And section 2.5 tells us that it, it didn't. The additional authority I handed up this morning, I won't ask you the court to read it at the moment, but it's a case called Derby and National Trust. And it's a case of um, drowning in a National Trust pond. I see the court is getting the decision out, so it may be an well, well, I was just um, opportune moment to, to, to look at it. I, I, I've, um, I've highlighted relevant passages. But, but just to summarise what happened in Derby, it, it, it's a fatal accident. Um, the uh, claimant's husband drowns in a pond on National Trust property. Um, his cases, or her cases, that um, the pond was dangerous because uh, it was of unknown depth in the middle. It, there were lots of weeds and uh, debris in the pond. Um, it was murky, so you couldn't see the bottom of the pond. And for all those reasons, the defendants were in breach of duty <coughs> in not warning him, or warning him adequately, not to swim in the pond. He, the action succeeded at first instance. This court uh, allowed the defendant's appeal really on the basis of this point, that the risk of swimming in the pond, or the risks of swimming in the pond, were mm. obvious, that if you chose to swim in a pond, which was... Um, of unknown depth, murky, had whatever characteristics the claimant was complaining about, then that's a risk which you chose to take, and the defendant owed the deceased no duty in respect of that risk. Now, there was a wrinkle in this case, and it was that there was present in the pond Viles disease, which created a risk of, to swimmers, to people entering the pond, a risk of um, infection and consequent illness. And by reason of that risk, there was a duty to prevent people from swimming in the pond, or to, or, or to warn them against swimming in the pond. And the claimant's case was that once one accepted that there was a duty to warn the deceased against swimming in the pond, and there'd been a breach of that duty because he hadn't been adequately warned, mm -hmm. then he was entitled to succeed. This court held not because of the scope of duty. The duty was to give him an adequate warning to safeguard him against contracting Viles disease. It was not a duty to safeguard him against the risk of drowning. And I have um, marked up on the report the paragraphs from the judgment of Lord Justice May, with whom the other members of the court agree. Starting at paragraph 21. Since we have the case out, I'll, I'll deal with this. Thank you. Sorry to take you out of turn. Um, 
Paragraph 21, the risk of Vars disease required a notice. It's permissible, submitted Mr. McLaren, who is of course representing the claimant, for the court to conclude that there was a duty to take a step for the purpose of guarding against Vars disease, which would in fact have prevented death by drowning. The cost and expense of the sign would not have been great, and the sign, whose main purpose may have been to prevent the effects of Vars disease, would also have given effective warning against the danger of drowning. Unpleasant though Vars disease, uh, I have no doubt, is, it was not the kind or, of risk or damage which Mr. Darby suffered, and any duty to warn against Vars disease cannot, in my judgment, support a claim for damages resulting from a quite different cause. And then he refers to the opinion of Lord Hoffman in Samco, which he quotes extensively. And I've <coughs> highlighted the quotation. I won't read through it now. But if I may go to paragraph 25 of this judgment, Lord Hoffman then proceeded to give the example of the mountaineer with which practitioners are very familiar. Thus, a case which promotes a duty based on the risk of a swimmer catching Vars disease will not, in my opinion, support a breach of duty founded upon a risk of drowning. The risks are of an intrinsically different kind, and so are the dependent duties. I, don't, I do not think this principle is negated by Mr. McLaren's reference to Jolly and Sutton, mm -hmm. since Lord Hoffman himself emphasised at page 192 that liability cannot depend on a failure to guard against a risk of a different kind from that which should have been foreseen. Failures which are not caused in, do not give rise to a liability in negligence. And the other members of the court agreed. Now, um, applying that principle to the facts of the present case, I have accepted that the defendants had a duty to Mr. James to safeguard him against some risk. And I, we, I, I, in answer to questions from the court, I've indicated the, the kind of thing that might have occurred. But that doesn't mean that they owe a duty in respect of this risk. The court will be familiar with the case of, of Tomlinson so familiar that I may not need to go to the case because the passages from Lord Hoffman's speech are really set out in other cases. But um, the court will be very familiar with the principle which Lord Hoffman articulated, that if people choose to take risks, then that is a matter for them. And uh, although the defendant uh, might, out of a sense of uh, paternalism, want to stop him from doing so, he's under no duty to stop him from doing so. If people want to... Um, dive, swim, kayak, whatever it is, that's their duty. And translating the facts of this case, if people want to sit on mango <coughs> ledges in, in precarious positions and circumstances where they might fall out, then that is the choice they make. Um, now, my learning friend, in his skeleton argument, says Tomlinson is distinguishing because in Tomlinson, there was found to be no danger due to the state of the premises. Whereas in this case, there was a danger. That is true, but it's irrelevant. passages from Lord Hoffman's speech to which I was adverting are to a different part of his speech. What Lord Hoffman says is as step one, I don't believe there was any danger um, due to the state of these premises. That was uh, not the view of all of the members of the House of Lords. Um, two of them felt that there was a danger due to the state of <coughs> Lord Hoffman went on to say, I don't believe there was any danger to the state, but he, if I'm wrong about that, if there was a danger, the claim still can't succeed because of this other principle, that 
there's no duty to safeguard a claimant against obvious risks. So that's the second ratio of Lord Hoffman's speech. But consider if in Tomlinson the relevant pond had had virus disease in it, as in Darwin National Trust. Would that have made a difference? Answer, no, of course not. There would then have been a danger due to the state of the premises, i.e. the danger of contracting virus disease. But that wouldn't have been the danger. That wouldn't have been the danger which uh, caused the claimant's injury. And therefore, not was not within the scope of the defendant's duty to safeguard the claimant against risk. So um, I spent rather a long time, I fear, making this point. But it's a very important point in my submission, uh, and one of which the court should not lose sight. The fact that there were risks against which the White Line Hotel had a duty to safeguard Mr. James does not mean that it had a duty to safeguard him against this risk. We've got to look at the scope of the duty. And the facts of the case. I'm sorry, my lady. And the facts of the case. Yes, yes, yes. Now, where do we go next? Uh, I'm going to go. Uh, I, I was going to go through uh, parts of the judgment. We, we started by looking. Yes, at, thank you. We started to look at the judgment, and um, looked at paragraph 41, findings to what happened, and at paragraph 43, the judge says, Mr. Walker suggested somewhat boldly in my view that the prosecution and guilty plea were irrelevant to the civil liability issues. I disagree. From my first reading of the files, I thought the guilty plea was potentially very relevant to the issues to be determined. I asked for the basis of I had a file, a full, file full of documents related to the prosecution, but no ability to ascertain what had been accepted by the defendants, given they pleaded guilty. Eventually, emails were produced between prosecuting and defence counsel regarding the basis of plea. I was very surprised to hear there was no formal document ever produced. Uh, I think, don't think that's right, actually, to an offence contrary to Section 3. Now, my uh, submission that the prosecution and guilty plea were irrelevant, I think on reflection, may have been slightly bold. Um, <laughs> They were of minimal relevance. They we, proved... we, we're amending your, your scale. <laughs> yes, but when, when one looks at... What, it, what is in play here is Section 11 of the Civil Evidence Act. When one looks at a, uh, the conviction, what is, as a matter of law, relevant is the memorandum of conviction, not the judge's sentencing re remarks, or the basis of plea, because the basis of plea might be construed as containing some kind of admission, which could be used in subsequent proceedings, but that's not the conviction. Are you saying the basis of plea, and, and I'm, this is a completely open question, Mr Walker, I'm yes. just not sure what your position is. We've got the basis of plea in the supplementary bundle, yes. page 20 22. and 22. Yeah. And so are you saying it, this is of minimal re relevance? I'm just trying to gauge yes. weight. Yes. That's right. It, it, the, the basis of plea 
is not the conviction. No, I've got that. So I just want to know... What is the relevance of the basis of plea? On your contention. Uh, it could be used in subsequent civil proceedings as, um, I suppose, an, an, uh, an admission, an out-of-court admission by the defendant. Forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but is the essence of it this? It goes to a question of weight. I, I wouldn't a weight to be attached to it. My lady, I wouldn't, with respect, put it that way. Right. Um, the, the judge thought the basis of plea was significant. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my submission, it wasn't. It wasn't of any significance, uh, and I don't shrink from saying that. The judge's sentencing remarks are not the conviction. I don't think, I don't uh, accept that they were relevant. What is relevant is the conviction itself. Um, what is the, con the, 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 the indictment is in the supplementary bundle at um, page 17. was the original indictment. The, the indictment uh, was in fact amended to add a count uh, 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 um, against the partnership as against, there, there were previously two, counts one and two were against Mrs. Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Lear for reasons which are not material to this appeal didn't want there to be a conviction of them in their individual names. I think it might have affected their ability to go to America or something. Um, um, what they preferred was a conviction of the White Lion Hotel, i.e. the partnership. And so what the prosecution did really uh, to accommodate them um, was to add a count, uh, which was equivalent of count one, except that it was a prosecution of the, of the partnership. So it's count one was the relevant count? Yes, yes. Well, I, I grapple with. I accept that um, the con for the purpose of Section Eleven of the Civil Evidence Act, it is the conviction. Yes. The conviction doesn't necessarily tell you everything, and the basis of plea can be important because it identifies what was the basis of that conviction, the factual basis of. Well, then, 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 then uh, one, one asks the question uh, rhetorically, what is the relevance of that? The relevance of that, I would admit, is that it may contain an admission by the defendants. But beyond that, what does the conviction prove? Well, it does contain admissions. Yes, it does. It? I accept but, that. But it, but it goes also, doesn't it, to when you're identifying, what was the risk? Um, and... and here we have. Yes, yes. It's articulated yes. and accepted by the people, by the partnership, by the hotel, what the risk was. So yes. I'm just struggling to see why that is of no relevance when we're putting together well, your well, structure, which starts with what were the well, risks. I, when I, 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 I accepted my submission that it was of no relevance, may have been somewhat bold. But it's no, but that was the conviction itself. You then said that the basis of plea and the sentencing remarks. You then said the conviction was of minimal relevance, yes. but the basis of plea and the sentencing remarks were of no relevance, and, and I interpret yes. that as you meaning they should not have played any part in the judge's consideration. I'm, I'm, I think my lady, Lady they Justice were... Nicola Davis, is testing you on that. Yes. As, um, as I am myself. I think I may have been a bit bold in, <laughs> in that way. <laughs> Um, you remain bold. Uh, yes. Um, the, the relevance of the conviction was this. It proved that the defendants were the occupiers of the White Lion Hotel. 
but that was admitted on the plea. I accept it proved that the defendants had failed to ensure the safety of persons not in their employment. Now, that meant that it failed to ensure that they were not exposed to some foreseeable risk. And it proved that the defendants were not contending it would not have been practicable to do anything about that risk because that would be a that would be the statutory defense now does, and, and I'm, uh, my apologies Mr Walker, speaking entirely for myself, what this basis of plea does is identify the particulars that are accepted both of the of the risk and the nature of it. Um, yes, Pallady, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to accept that. Um, the the basis of plea is a, on pages 20 and 22. Page 20 is the exchange between counsel, and page 22 is the actual document. Yeah. And that's really the important one. And that's the important it? one. Yes. Uh, and two, they accept they did not carry out a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. Uh, I only pause to say they weren't charged with failing to carry out a risk assessment. But, so that's just part of the background. They did not appreciate those windows presented a risk. However, they accept that the sash windows did present a low risk that someone may injure themselves. Um, the reason why I submitted that that was irrelevant was that the relevant question was not whether this risk or these risks existed, but whether the defendants were under a duty to safeguard Mr. James against the risk which eventually he accepted. And I don't shrink from the submission that the conviction and the, the, and the sentencing remarks, if need be, are not relevant to that issue. So maybe we go back to the judgment. I just want to clear this up. The basis of plea to the Section 3 offence, which was accepted by the prosecution, was in essence that it was admitted that the window, given its size and position and the lack of restricted, presented a low but material risk to adults and not just to children. Um, the basis of plea doesn't say anything uh, about adults or children. It just accepts a risk. I, I accept that. The basis of plea was not that the risk was only to children, but it doesn't expressly say that it's a risk to adults as well as children. It simply says there is a low risk. And I am prepared to accept, and I, and I have accepted, that the window presented a low risk, or some low risks, to adults. And 
paragraph 48. The judge said, risk identified by the prosecution actually been addressed. Brackets, the obvious course was that actually adopted the use of window restrictors. The deceased would not have been able to fall as he did. That, that's not actually strictly right, as I point out in my skeleton. The risk was, in fact, addressed by the use of fixed window restrictions subsequently. But it didn't have to be addressed in that way. The um, defendants could have avoided prosecution or avoided any breach of Section 3 by a variety of measures. And this was just one of them. So it isn't true to say, but for the commission of the offence, the accident wouldn't have happened. So if it does take us back to the basis of plea, which yes, it specifically plea referred to restrictors. restrictors. Yes. You could have had removable window restrictors, of course. As I, as You're I, saying that would change the case? I'm sorry, Minister. You're saying that would change the, the, the position? It would change the position but if there had been removable window restrictors and um, the, guest, the hotel guests had been able to remove the restrictors if one could remove them in one's own home, then uh, someone want, wanting to open the window would simply remove the restrictors, obviously. So it would make a difference. But anyhow, this, that, that, this is a very small point. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the judge then goes on to the law. And there's a reference in paragraph 53 to a case called Lewis and Six Continents. Now, that's not a case which I rely on on this appeal. And it's not a case I relied on particularly below. But it, it caused a good deal of trouble. Um, Lewis and Six Continents was a case in which um, someone had, while looking out of a window, had fallen out of the window. And the Court of Appeals said that um, there was nothing dangerous about this window. What was dangerous was what the person leaning out of it chose to do. There's nothing dangerous about the window. And the defence team, not, not those instructing me, I hasten to add now, but those acting for Mr. and Mrs. Lear in the criminal proceedings, decided to argue that this was a point of law and that the prosecution should fail in lining it because the case was indistinguishable from Lewis and Six Continents. And they argued this out before the trial judge and lost. They appealed to the Court of Appeal Criminal Division and they got very short shrift. And with due respect, rightly so, because this is, is, wasn't a point of law. The, Court of, the Criminal Division said, this isn't a point of law at all. This is simply a question of fact. Does this window present a danger or not? And uh, this window is not the same as the window in Lewis and Six Continents. It has a lower threshold. And it's a matter for the jury whether it's. Uh, and so the, 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 um, the criminal proceedings were, was, were, as it were, postponed, the trial was postponed. While they went, uh, while they made the submission, went to court of appeal at considerable expense and expenditure of time and costs uh, on what was, uh, in my submission, a completely misconceived um, excursion. Lewis and Six Continents is not an authority on which I rely. On, in that case, the view was taken that there was no risk; it didn't present a danger. I had accepted, and the defendants accepted by their plea, that in this case. There was, there was such a risk. So I'm not relying on Lewis and Six Continents. And the, 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 the judge dealt with that in some um, in some detail. Um, and then um, Paragraph 63, given the matter set out above, it's helpful to take stock in relation to the duty of care imposed by Section 2. In my judgment, matters can be summarised as follows. 
The defendants, through the guilty plea, accepted that there was a reasonably foreseeable risk of harm, material risk to adults of falling from the sash window due to its low position. Although Mr. Walker initially suggested the conviction was irrelevant, as it could have been based upon a risk to children, clarification proved this not to have been the case. Mr. Walker acknowledged that the conviction on the basis of a risk to a visitor, such as the deceased, and didn't try to go behind it. Um, and then he seeks to distinguish Tomlinson, because he says, in this case, it's possible to identify the state of the premises which carried the risk of injury. The ability to fully open the lower sash of the window with a low sill, giving rise to the risk of a person falling out. Lord Hoffman in Tomlinson referred to the water as being perfectly safe for all normal activities, the actions of the claimant in that case being abnormal. Here the window was not safe for all normal activities. Um, as I submitted a little while ago, Tomlinson, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, was a case in which uh, there, was no there was no danger, but that was the first ratio of Lord Hoffman's speech. The second ratio was that even if there was a danger, there was no duty owed. And as I pointed out by reference to Derby, supposing there'd been some, some danger, e.g. Vars disease, that wouldn't affect the decision. Mr. Walker, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes, please. When you refer to the second ratio of Tomlinson, do you really mean the part of the speech, the reasoning that's over, sir? Well, my lady, I... I don't. Um, I, I mean, I can see the point, but I don't accept that it is over. To look, Lord Hoffman, from, from recollection, says this. Uh, um, this water didn't was perfectly safe. But if I'm wrong about. But did he say, I mean, I haven't got the passage, but did he well, say I, he was wrong about that, or, or did he, he says, says, I, he says, I, go, you, says you, I mean, surely it's over to if he's saying... Should I, but should I go to Tomlinson now? To, well, I'm not sure it really matters very much. It's just that I've, I've, I've never heard of the concept of the second ratio, and it seems to me if the primary ground of the decision was that um, there was no risk from the state of the premises, then what Lord Hoffman had to say about uh, the, what the position might have been if that primary finding is wrong, is, is over to. Um, lady, it's possible with respect for a, a decision to have more than one ratio de side in there. Right. Um, Well, I, may I just ask, since I've asked the question, may, may I just ask the court to, to turn up Tom sure. and I won't spend yes. much time on it. It's, it's you, 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 you ladyships don't have dividers on, on the authorities bundle. No. It's the uh, core authorities bundle. Um, the report starts at page 94. I think you may be on our pagination bottom right-hand corners. You're probably around pages 129 and 137. 127, I think. 127. 127. Okay, yep. I'll take this as quickly as I can. Uh, 127, danger due to the state of the premises. Lord Hoffman says the first question, therefore, is whether there was a risk within the scope of the statute, a danger due to the state of the premises. Yeah. And he goes on to question. Paragraph 29. 29, no. But he then says, 29, I shall nevertheless go on to consider the matter on the assumption that there was. Then that makes it obiter, doesn't it? I'm sorry, lady. That makes it obiter, doesn't it? Um... Well, if it is over, over to, it's a, 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 a <laughs> dictum from a powerful <laughs> source, let's put it that Well, I don't think any of us would suggest it was not a powerful source. No. Um, and when, when he's considering that question, he comes to that uh, paragraph 41, page 131. Where, having 
having said that he doesn't regard financial costs as significant, he says there are two other related considerations far more important. The first is the social value of the activities. The judge in this case thought there was no social value in having windows which could open. I don't accept the proposition. The, there is a social value mm -hmm. in being able to open a window. Particularly but at the, the moment. But that's, that's not the general. The second, this is at the top of uh, page one through two, the second is the question of whether the council should be entitled to allow people of full capacity to decide for themselves whether to take the risk. And uh, he deals with this paragraph 44, referring to earlier cases, uh, Lord Phillips in Donoghue and Folkestone Properties. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to read this. These passages are very well known. Yes. Mountains and buckets and he and says it, uh, Paragraph 50. He says that even if swimming had not been prohibited and the council had owed a duty under section 2.2, the duty wouldn't have required them to take any steps to prevent Mr. Tomlinson from diving or warning him against dangers which were perfectly obvious. Thank you. Su su suggest to me that's an over dictum. Um, I, I characterise it as a second ratio, but uh, it's, it's obviously a powerful dictum. And it's the point I've made, I'm a f mm. I fear, several times this morning already. I think we have the point. Your Lordship, and Got it. Now, um, in fact, um, the Lord Hutton thought that there was a risk due to the state of the premises. And one finds this in Lord Hutton's speech page uh, 138 where uh, paragraph 64 he quotes from Lord Phillips' judgment in um, Donoghue and Folkestone and properties. And quote, there are, however, circumstances in which it may be foreseeable that a trespasser would appreciate a dangerous feature on premises poses a risk of injury, but will nevertheless deliberately court the danger and risk the injury. It seems to me that, at least where the individual is an adult, it will be rare that those circumstances will be such that the occupier can reasonably expect to offer some protection against the risk. Lord Phillips then went on to state that where a person was um, tempted by some natural feature of the occupier's land to engage in some activity, such as mountaineering, which carried a risk of injury, he could not ascribe to the state of the premises an injury sustained in carrying on that activity. And then he says, however, in the present case, as I have stated, I incline to the view that the dark and murky, murky water can be viewed as the state of the premises. So uh, uh, unlike Lord Hockham, he thought there was a danger due to the state mm -hmm. of the premises, but he considered the risk of the claim to striking his head on the bottom of the lake was not one against the defendant. Might reasonably expect to offer him some protection, and accordingly they weren't liable uh, because they owed him no duty. Um, and Need to go to it at the moment. I'm sorry. Perhaps we don't need to go I to it at the moment. So, um, um, the top, I'm back. I'm on the I'm on the judgment in the present case now. Um, I was reading. 
reading from yes. page um, 69, paragraph of the charge And page 70, the judge says, so drawing matters together, there was a duty owed to a lawful visitor, a foreseeable risk of serious injury, no social value to occur, to be serious if not fatal, no social value, the activity leading to the risk, a minimal cost of preventative measures. Despite the existence of these factors, Mr. Walker submitted it didn't follow the defence for a breach of the duty under section 2, as they'd failed to do something about the window with the result that the accident occurred. Rather, he argued that there was an insuperable point which the claimant faced, willing to run the risk from an obvious danger. This Mr. Walker submitted was fatal to his claim under the Act. Um, which uh, was indeed and is my submission. And uh, then there's a, a consideration of a number of authorities. Uh, as I've remarked earlier, in which the claim failed because of what I'll call the insuperable point. And not a single case in which the claim had succeeded. And I'll have to come to, to those authorities shortly. If I could, I'll skip over his sub reading of those authorities for a moment, if I may, and uh, I'll go back to paragraph 76. I'm not going to read it again. You'll be happy to hear. <laughs> but I go back to paragraph 76, and I, 77 records my submission that the claimant's case should fail in Lymony, as the fatal accident was any of you consequent mm -hmm. upon his reason to lean out and out of the second floor window, which he held open to an extent sufficient to enable him to fall out of it. The risk of a fall such as it was was therefore one which he had created was obvious. In those circumstances, the defendant's case, his claim cannot succeed. The person of full age of capacity who chooses to run an obvious risk cannot found an action against against the base the latter as either or not preventing him from so doing. I'll refer to this as the insuperable point. The insuperable point such as that the risk was foreseeable or even foreseen. The absence of risk assessment for the risk could have been avoided by the defendant without difficulty or undue expense. That's a quotation from my skeleton yes. argument. Um, and at 78, the judge notes that although neither counsel had referred to section 25, it provides, then he goes on to, to um, set out what it provides. Mm -hmm. And paragraph 78 ends by saying correctly, the defence of common law only operates where the claimant voluntarily accepts a risk negligently created by the defendant's negligence. Section 2.5 concerns the breadth or ambit of a duty, i.e. if Section 2.5 bites, there's no obligation to act under Section 2 and thus no negligence. Now that is correct. That's the reason. Um, over the page 79, Mr Walker didn't refer to the defence of Valenta, rather he concentrated on the insuperable point, no duty. However, his argument that Section 2 of the 1957 Act does not impose an obligation on an occupier in respect of an obvious risk, um, so no duty to act arises to address such a risk, is in direct conflict with the argument that the duty under Section 2 must necessarily reflect a mandatory requirement of the criminal law to address a real and material risk as accepted to have existed here, even though it's obvious. This conflict was not addressed in any of the authorities to which I refer. Neither counsel addressed it head on in their submissions. Now this is the point at which the learned judge, with due respect, uh, goes wrong. The argument that section two is in direct conflict with a mandatory requirement of the criminal law to address a real and material risk. 
So what he is, um, as appears from the rest of the judgment, starting to hint at is that notwithstanding section two, um, a mandatory requirement of the criminal law to address a real and material risk trumps section two, five. There will be a duty. He says this conflict was not addressed in any of the authorities, uh, which is hardly surprising since I'm not aware of this point ever being taken before. <laughs> and certainly not taken in any of the authorities. Um, and I, I indicated some little while ago in the course of these submissions what the fallacy in this is. It is a mandatory requirement of the criminal law to address risks under Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. But the criminal law provides for the sanctions which flow from the failure to comply with that mandatory requirement, i.e. criminal sanction. <laughs> Not civil liability. Indeed, as um, the court will be aware, section 47 of the Health and Safety at Work Act expressly provides to the contrary. I won't ask for the court to turn it up immediately, but it's um, it's in the uh, authorities bundle. At uh, page ten, perhaps, perhaps I ought. This is very important. Perhaps I ought to. Uh, page ten, section forty-seven, civil liability. Nothing in this part should be construed as conferring a right of action in any civil proceeding in respect of any failure to comply with any duty imposed by sections 2 to 7 or any contravention of section 8. Now, the learned judge, notwithstanding that express provision, took the view that if there was uh, a, a breach of Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act, civil liability should follow. Paragraph 80, the learned judge refers to Mr. Evans' skeleton argument. He said the conviction could be seen to be conclusive on the issue of breach of duty. Um, proof of conviction under this section gives rise to the statutory presumption laid down in section 2A. If not conclusive, significant weight ought to be attached to the convictions. It would be odd if a hotelier could stand convicted of criminal offences relating to the exposure of guests to health and safety risks, that there be a determination that, that to the civil standard the risk in question was absent or de minimis, or if the risk existed, it was certain one that in all the circumstances did not reasonably require any steps to guard against it. Well, I've indicated what's wrong with that submission. It doesn't acknowledge that there's simply no duty. And then it says he did not develop the argument much, if any, further during his oral submissions, which um, uh, supports what I told the court earlier, that this exegesis upon which the judge embarked was really his own idea. It, 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 um, it, it um, was supported by, in his judgment, by authorities which he had um, uh, found for himself following the hearing. So at the conclusion of the hearing, uh, your position was completely irrelevant, and Mr Evans's was more than de minimis and carries some weight. Yes. And, and that was how it was left. And then yes. you say... Mr. Evans' submission, of course, is that it should be conclusive on breach of duty. The point I made is 
we're not concerned with breach of duty, we're concerned with whether there is a duty. Um, that's, that's how matters, matters rested. 82, neither council cited any authority upon the relationship between the requirements of the criminal law and the civil law. Now, the learned judge did his own research to ascertain whether there was any authority on this issue. And what he came up with was the decision of Justice Stanley Burnton, as he then was, in Hampstead Heath Swimming Club. Corporation of London. Did the judge notify the parties of his intention to refer or invite submissions in relation to the Hampstead case? No. Uh, he, no. Um, um, was it pick, picked up by either party? Did either of you seek to make additional submissions when it was sent out? Oh, we saw the judgment in draft. Yeah. No, my, lady, uh, my, my understanding is that uh, responses to the draft judgment are simply inviting in relation to correcting obvious uh, well, well, they are, errors. Not they are, of course, submission. but there's, there's also um, quite a lot of law on um, seeking clarification where appropriate rather than appealing. Well, we didn't, I, I didn't consider it appropriate to seek to reopen my submission. The, the, the only hint, if I may put it, the, the hint as to what the judge was thinking came in, when, when I was, of course I called no evidence, I made the last speech. And the learning judge said to me, this is reflected in the judgment. He said to me, well, Mr. Wolfe, can you suggest to me any circumstance in which there has been a breach of the criminal law, but civil liability did not follow? Those may not have been his precise words, but that's the just what he said. And on my feet, um, <coughs> my answer was, yes, um, speeding, for example. You may be convicted of speeding, but it doesn't mean that you're... Um, you're civilly liable if, uh, if if there's an accident. That was the example which most which most quickly came to mind. Had I had some more notification or warning of this question, I, I would have said yes. All of the cases on um, which I've already cited, uh, or most of them, Geary and Weatherspoon, um, Edwards and Sutton, Poppleton. Because in all of those cases, and I'm going to show you the court those cases, in all of those cases, there was a finding, there were findings of fact to the effect that the defendants had not ensured the safety of persons not in their employment. So in all of those cases, the defendants would have been guilty of an offence under Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work. But the question the judge, in fact, asked you was, had there been convictions? Were there cases in relation to convictions? That was the question. Yes. The, 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 of course, of course it, it must be obvious, must it not, that if the learned judge is right in his general approach, the question is not whether the defendant has been convicted of an but whether the defendant has committed an offence under Section 3. Because it can't be, it, the principle can't depend upon whether there, adventitiously there's been a prosecution or not. And as I will show you, show the court, um, in, in many of these cases, and I've cited three of the skeleton, and Darby, Darby and another one, um, Darby and National Trust, the National Trust hadn't ensured the safety of visitors to this National Trust property because they were at risk of getting virus disease if they went in the water. Um, in, 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 in Edwards, uh, the London Borough of Sutton hadn't ensured the safety of Mr. Edwards because, as Judge Gore pointed out, there were lots of risks of injury uh, which he might suffer. In, um, in, I think it's Poppleton, the judge trying the case finds that the defendants were in breach of duty in a number of respects, failing to supervise learners, failing to uh, monitor them, uh, a, a lot of aspects of failing to ensure the safety. And, and yet it's not argued in any of those cases that because there, will have been an, there could have been a conviction under Section 3 of the Health and Safety Work Act, uh, the civil liability must follow.
Now, um, as I said, I don't judge um, Fowl of Hampstead Heath Swimming Club and the Corporation of London, which is not an authority which supports his approach at all. I'll show the court the case. It's in the core bundle. Um, the court doesn't have dividers. It's divider 11, but it's at page 158. I may just remind the court of what the case was about. Um, the Corporation of London had responsibility for the management of the ponds on Hampstead Heath. Uh, there are three ponds. Uh, there's the men's pond, the ladies' pond, and the mixed ponds. And uh, members of the swimming club wanted to swim in the mixed pond early in the morning at a time when it was unattended by any lifeguards. And the Corporation of London would not allow them to do so. And the reason that the Corporation of London gave was that it felt that if an accident occurred, it would be liable to prosecution under Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work And that was not a risk that it was prepared to take. And these were proceedings for judicial review of the decision of the Corporation of London, which was evidently amenable to judicial review. And the application was granted. The reasoning being that if a swimmer were to sustain injury, solely due to his decision to swim in the pool at a time when it was unattended. That would be a risk which he had chosen to take. And the, the holding is referred to in the head note. It's the last paragraph in the head note at 159. That if an adult swimmer with knowledge of the risks of swimming, chose to swim unsupervised in a pond that had no hidden dangers. The, risk he, the risks he incurred were the result of his decision and not of the permission given to him to swim, and that therefore those risks were not the result of the conduct by the employer of his undertaking, and the employer was not liable to be convicted of an offence under Section 3. So... Um, the hypothesis was that the pool pond had no hidden dangers and that the swimmer who chose to swim uh, in, the pond, in the pond unsupervised and take that risk uh, could not uh, cause prosecution because the risk he was taking was not the result of the conduct of the employer in allowing him to swim. It was the result of his own decision. So that, that says nothing about whether a conviction under Section 3 would be of any relevance to civil liability. But I've highlighted 
passages in the judgment of this Justice Stanley Burton, which are um, of relevance. There's a, there's a longish discussion of Tomlinson. And if I may take this up, the judgment up at page, paragraph 41, which is page 172 of the bundle. Would you like us to read the sideline passage? Yes, please. Paragraph 40, quite a lot of paragraph 44 finds its way in a, an unacknowledged citation in the judge's judgment. Yes, but, but uh, the, point, the point is made in paragraph 43 is the decision of the House of Lords um, in Tomlinson is not authority of the proposition the defendants in that case were free from any criminal responsibility resulting from Mr. Tomlinson's ac accident. I mean, the, the, the pond in Tomlinson uh, may or may not have been in a state which um, uh, invoked a breach of Section 3. In fact, on um, Lord Hoffman's, in Lord Hoffman's speech, uh, he, he has found that it did not because he finds there's no danger due to the state of the premises. We looked at that earlier. But as I point, I mean, there could have been, the, the pond could have been vast to seize, for example, but the result would have been the same. And the, the, what, what then happens, the judgment uh, concludes at page 63. Read. It doesn't conclude there, but the passage I'm referring to starts at page, paragraph 63 on 176. In my judgment, the requirement in section 3 that the exposure to risk should be by the conduct of the employer's undertaking is subject to the same considerations as those referred to by the House of Lords in Tomlinson. If an adult swimmer is given permission to swim unsupervised in a pond that has no hidden dangers and the sw dis swimmer decides to swim in it, the risks he incurs in doing so are in a sense the result of both the commission and the decision. But if the law is to protect individual freedom of action and to avoid imposing free and our safety regime, it must discriminate between these causes. In my judgment, the purpose of Section 3, if an adult swimmer with knowledge of the risks chooses to swim unsupervised, the risks he incurs are the result of his decision and not of the commission giving him to swim. It follows that those risks are not the result of the conduct by the employer of his undertaking and the employer is not liable to be convicted of an offence under that provision. So for those reasons, the judge considered that there wasn't really um, a risk of uh, prosecution such as would justify the uh, Corporation of London's um, refusal of permission. Um, the, without saying that the decision is wrong, um, it's, um, it, it must be debatable, must it not, because um, it proceeds on the assumption that the only risk uh, which needed to be addressed was uh, a hypothetical adult swimmer being allowed to um, swim in the pond at a time when there were no lifeguards. But there must be other risks, for example, of children trying to swim in the pool in the early morning, of um, people who are obviously incompetent or ill trying to swim in the pond and getting into difficulties of people being drunk and behaving in a, in a dangerous way. There must be lots of risks which may manifest themselves if there's no supervision. And um, those risks might have justified the uh, Corporation of London taking the line that it did. But it, uh, the, the case went off on the basis that the only risk it felt to be considered was the risk of an adult swimmer choosing to swim unsupervised. Uh, many 
how this, the decision is, is what it is. Um, but it's, it's no authority to support the um, uh, to support the judge's approach in the present uh, case. Now, a par a paragraph eighty-eight. I mean, the so, so what the judge doesn't really derive any help from the Hampstead case. He just goes on in paragraph eighty-seven to say that the converse of Mr. Justice Stanley Burns' proposition holds true. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, with respect, I find that difficult. That, that, that particular paragraph difficult to follow. But I content myself with saying that the case really doesn't lend any support to the judge's approach. No, and I don't, I don't think he expressly derives any support from it. No. So we just make anyway. All right. <clears throat> now, paragraph eighty-eight is important in my submission because it gives a clue to the judge's reasoning. In relation to the interaction of the criminal and civil law. He says it's of significance that both the criminal and civil jurisdiction allow for orders for compensation. See generally POLA. Here there was a guilty plea. In effect, an admission of entitlement to compensation on the basis of a failure to act to remove a risk. And then he refers to section 11 of the Civil Evidence Act, which permits a challenge to the commission of the offence. And then he says it would be strange indeed that the criminal jurisdiction provides compensation in respect of an accident, but the civil jurisdiction denies it entirely. A for sure I the expectation that the scope of tort would already be wider than that of crime. This is simply wrong. There is no entitlement to compensation on a conviction. And the criminal jurisdiction does not provide compensation. It may entitle, it entitles the court to make a compensation order, but only in clear cases where there can be no dispute as to the liability to compensate. And I, I will ask, I, I do ask the court to look at the case of Poland, which. Um, Court, the court, members of the court may or may not be familiar with the criminal jurisdiction. Uh, I have limited familiarity uh, with it, but um, it's uh, sufficient uh, to um, to say confidently that the proposition that the criminal statutes provide an entitlement is wrong. Bola is in the core bundle at page 71. And um, the facts are not important. Uh, a, a workman fell from a raised platform while demolishing a wall. The wall collapsed and fell on him, causing him brain injury. And the um, Appellant, who had been convicted of an offence of uh, under Section Two of the Health and Safety Work Act, he was an employer, was ordered to pay ninety thousand pounds compensation, and there was appeal against the compensation order. And um, I've highlighted uh, on page seventy-two a passage, a short passage from the head. Um, if I may start about three lines above the sidelining. The court had derived assistance from an early consideration of compensation orders in Inwood, where it was said that compensation orders were introduced into the law as a convenient and a rapid means to, of avoiding the expense of civil litigation when the criminal clearly had the means which would enable the compensation to be paid. Compensation orders should not be used when there was any doubt as to the liability to compensate, or when there was real doubt 
as to whether the convicted man could find the compensation. The legislation left a considerable area of judgment to the court, and the court should follow a common sense uh, course. And that uh, is um, the headnote finds its way. Uh, so the headnote records what is in the judgment um, at paragraph uh, judgments to justice. Um, Headley. Headley, yes. At um, paragraph 33, which is on page 74, where he reads from uh, Judgment Lord Justice Scarman in Inwood, and it really um, repeats what is in the headnote, or the headnote repeats what is here. Halfway down, compensation orders should certainly not be used when there's any doubt as to the liability to compensate. Thank you. So the, the judge's observation at paragraph 88 that it would be strange indeed uh, is, is once again simply wrong. Would you also say that the assertion that the guilty plea is in effect, in effect an admission of entitlement to compensation yes. is also wrong? It is it, it, clearly wrong. Now, what the learned judge then did, and I can take this very shortly, he went on to some other cases which he had found for himself. And on page 80, he refers to two first instance decisions, one called Cockerill and one called Tompkins and Tap. <coughs> now, I don't need to ask you to turn these up, but I can just tell you what they concern. The court will be aware that prior to the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act of 2013, Breaches of statutory duty under regulations passed under the Health and Safety at Work Act were actionable, were civilly actionable. So take, for example, the work at height regulations. If you fail to provide a guardrail on a platform, that's a breach of the work at height regulations. If the claimant succeeds, the breach of the regulations doesn't need to show negligence. The defendant may not have known that the guardrail wasn't there, it's liable for breach of the regulations. Now, that, the law was changed by the Enterprise and Regulatory Reform Act of 2013. And what it was changed to, it changed it by amending section 47 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. And one can see the amended form in the First Authorities Bundle at page 10. Now, I read section 47. <clears throat> I read section 47 1, which, which uh, had always been there. But 47 2 was added by the 2013 Act. And it provides a breach of a duty imposed by a statutory instrument containing health and safety regulations shall not be actionable except, except to the extent that regulations under this section so provide. So you can no longer invoke a breach of the regulations as uh, giving you a cause of action. But there is, there is a debate as to whether breach of regulations will ipso facto 
demonstrate that the defendant has been negligent. In the case of Cockrell, the deputy judge said no. In the case of Tonkins and Tapp, his Honour Judge Gore, who had been the first instance judge in Edwards and uh, London Borough Sutton, took the opposite view. Well, he didn't quite go that far, did he? I thought he said he'd need more persuasion and argument or something. Um, well, uh, uh, paragraph 94 of this judgment, um, Judge Cotter says, His Honour Judge Gore reached a different conclusion over time. So you've got a different conclusion over to, and where you've got the judge in 95 saying, well, I don't have to resolve the issue. Yes, that's right. But where does this take but us? Th th these cases are nothing to the point at all. Why, Why are we, are we looking them? at them then? <laughs> because they're cited in the judgment. They, they, well. they, because the, ju the judge sought to derive some comfort from them. What, what judge Gore, in Judge Gore's case, there were alleged to be a number of breaches of the uh, work at height regulation. There wasn't a there wasn't a guardrail around a working platform. Um, Judge Gore found against the claimant on the facts, but he then said, "If I, if if I found if I had found accepted the claimant's version of the accident, the question would then arise of whether the defendant would have been liable." Uh, for breach of the work at height regulations, notwithstanding the change in the law um, which has been implemented. Um, and then he says, th there's a quotation which I won't read, it's, it's somewhat confusing with due respect, uh, suggesting that uh, because the statutory duties emanate from EU directives, um, they, they, they might not be um, <coughs> the, the repeal of them might not be effective but it isn't where we get to what we, what we uh, see in paragraphs and 96 and, said, and 96 he says at 106 I would not have been prepared to find without much more analysis and argument that the effect of section 69 was to deprive an accident victim of entitlement mm -hmm. to rely upon a finding that breach of statutory duty constituted it so facto negligence and then Judge Cotter ends by saying, I don't have to resolve this issue. It seems to me the example given by Rowena Collins' right of staff and post office may well provide circumstances where civil liability may no longer follow the breach of regulations. However, in other cases, liability must surely still follow breach of the regulation ipso facto. Um, so it's, it's not of any relevance because, of course, it's addressing a different question. It's not addressing the question of whether there is a duty of care at all. It's addressing the question of standard of care. And the, the, the attitude is explicable on the basis that regulations may set the standards. So if there are standards imposed by regulations, by work at height regulations, the employer who fails to comply with them may well have been negligent because he's failed to comply with what would be regarded as a, an accepted industry standard. So. I, I have some sympathy with the proposition that uh, a breach of the regulations uh, may be <coughs> strong evidence of negligence. But, the, but this discussion is irrelevant for another reason, because we're not dealing with duties which are derived from regulations made under the Health and Safety Work yeah. Act. We're dealing with the relationship between Section 3. Yes, absolutely. And Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's a, com it's a complete it, it's non issue. Right. Non and I, I've, I've only troubled the court with it because it felt it was part of the judge's um, research which led to his decision. So, as, as can be seen, uh, the uh, view of the law which the judge intuitively thought must be right that civil liability must follow from criminal responsibility. Fortified by his 
view that um, the powers of criminal courts act created an entitlement to compensation and that it would be strange if the courts could deny compensation. So, so is your submission that this is legally irrelevant? It gives you an insight into the judge's thought? Uh, absolutely. It is, yeah. it is the judge's reasoning. Yeah. It's the, okay. this, this is... Uh, this is the basis of the judge. The judge has no reasoning other than this. The judge's reasoning is, I, I, he, he starts by saying, yes, I accept there's a, on the face of things a willing acceptance of risk, paragraph 76 of the judgment, but that's not the end of the story because one then has to go on to consider the significance of the conviction. And in my judgment, I'm paraphrasing it, the conviction is highly relevant because from the criminal conviction, it, because as it were, the greater includes the lesser, it must follow that there would be civil liability. And yeah. if one were to ask the judge, well, um, what authority do you have to support uh, that view? Um, he says, one, the right to compensation, and two, the regulations by analogy would do it. Which had nothing to do, which had nothing to do with it. And what, what, what he does not recognize uh, is that there is, n uh, I've said this before, there is no authority, at, no case at all, in which this has been uh, found to be so. And this, this point has never been argued. And it's surprising that it's never been argued. And if he's right, if he were right, this would have a dramatic effect, would it not, on the law of torts? It would be a, be a landmark decision. But, but it's not perhaps not surprising it hasn't been argued in view of the clear relationship that Parliament set out between the sections. Two, 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 five. Yes. Right. I mean, that's why it hasn't been argued, perhaps. Well, it hasn't been argued, and you've taken us to it. But it is now. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. Yes. Yeah, Milady, section 2.5, of course, only arises in the context of occupiers' liability. There are many other branches of the law in which uh, this doctrine could, could be invoked, which did not involve occupiers. Yes, yeah, that's true. That is a good point. Uh, um, now, where have we got to? Well, uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking longer than, uh, than, I, than I had hoped I would. Um, and uh, if, if, I'm, if I may be allowed to make an extra time, then please let me have extra time. Yes, yes. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, however, you did suggest that you were going to go back and go through all the authorities. Well, I, I'm not And I'm not really board. sure how that's going to help us, because no, you've you, you no, made your key point. I have. And... But I, I do. I do just want to show. I do just want to show the court um, mm -hmm. some of the authorities. I don't. I really don't need to. Going, <coughs> going to what? I'm sorry, Melinda. Going to what issue? I mean, get, what, go, what are go, we going go, to get go, from going the authorities? To the, going to the issue of, of the application of the um, insuperable point. Um, going to the to show the court that in many of these cases, the defendants would undoubtedly have been guilty of an offence under Section 3 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. Well, one thing that we did get from Hampstead uh, was the passage, was it at somewhere around paragraph 25, of the extreme danger in any court looking at what the position would have been under the criminal law? I, I, I speak entirely for myself, but I do not easily understand how delving through the authorities to find if there was a basis for a possible breach of Section 3 is really going to take our deliberation. It was paragraph 23 of, the, of um, Hampstead. Um, well, uh, uh, may I suggest that we pause now? It's two minutes to one. And I'm the sort of kindly judge that will give you an extra two minutes over lunch. Um, may I suggest that you just have a, a think about how we address, particularly given paragraph 23 of the Hampstead case, just just how much detail you want to, to go through with these authorities. If you, if you want to take us to them, as you say, we have the time and we will certainly go to them. Yes, uh, Lady, if I'm permitted to, I, I would not... Uh, expect to take more than another half an hour. But what I, what I had, to, just to indicate, what I prepared, was proposed to do was to show your, show the court the 
cases which are referred to in paragraph 6 of my skeleton. Mm -hmm. Where I say, if the learned judge's reasoning is correct, it's surprising the point doesn't seem to have been taken by the claimant in any of the cases referred to in the judgment where the risk of claimant is found to be reasonably foreseeable. Indeed, there was no possible impracticability defence. I was proposing to show the court very briefly those three authorities. I, I would have added to them Derby and the National Trust, but I've already shown you. We've been through that. And then to say a word, and really not much more than a word, on the individual grounds of appeal, which I address in... Um, it can probably be grouped together, actually, because they are almost like sub-headings yes. to, to a certain extent, aren't they? Yes. Very well. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Um, two o'clock, please.